Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 15 minute quarter. My name is Nicholas Brown, one of the partners here at Granite Harbor Advisors. And uh, we got a lot to talk about today. Um, this quarter, we're politely calling it back in tax. Uh, like most of this year, taxes have been at the forefront of everyone's mind. Uh, we're financial planners, so we're a little bit too cheap to license the ACDC song that inspired that nickname. Uh, but hopefully it's playing in subconsciously in the back of your mind because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about taxes today. And since we're going to spend some time talking about taxes, we always got to start with the legal stuff. Uh, this is probably going to be the type of quarterly update that our lawyers absolutely hate because uh, we're going to talk about taxes. We're going to talk a little bit about politics. We're going to talk about the markets. Um, and anytime you start diving into all those subjects at once, it gets a little bit sticky. So I do want to make sure that everybody knows, hey, this is for informational purposes only. We're not trying to provide direct tax advice or investment advice through these webinars. We really just want to provide information. And the stuff we're talking about is based on what is available to us today. So we talk about tax brackets, we talk about calculations, we talk about um, you know, proposals. These things can all change and our views and opinions may change, which is a good last point for me to make. Some of this stuff is going to be opinion based. Uh, it's the opinions of me, not necessarily Granite Harbor Advisors. Um, but you know, we really just want to provide actionable, helpful information to as many people as we can. I mentioned at the beginning, my name is Nicholas Brown. I am one of the partners here at Granite Harbor Advisors. Uh, two others, Brian Sack, Tim Smith, are also very keyed in on the subject of taxes. And so you will probably hear from them as well later on in the year as we get more detail about the tax proposals that are in place um, and the different impacts and responses that it could have. For today, we're going to focus on what are the main tax changes and their impact on the market. And when any time we talk about taxes, it tends to get pulled into a conversation about politics. And that's one of the three things that my parents always told me, hey, maybe don't talk about that at a dinner party. Um, but it's a little unavoidable for the purposes of this conversation. So I want to make a quick note about politics, because when we talk about markets, we talk about investment performance, politics and political parties comes up a lot. And the reason why I love these two graphs right here is because it really does illustrate the fact that the market is rather indifferent to political party. The market does not inherently care whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, whether you have control of Congress or the White House. It's not to say that those things don't matter, but what's important takeaway here is that it's just one input into the market. So whether we have Republicans in control of Congress, whether we have uh, Democrats in control of the White House, what tends to happen is, quote unquote, the market finds a way. And that's a really key takeaway because there's going to be change. There's always going to be change. And it might be driven by Democrats. It might be driven by Republicans. But the key thing is it's always going to be there. And how efficient is the market at processing that change? I think that's what most people are really concerned about. So where are we right now? Uh, Democrats are in control of the House, Senate, and White House. That's nothing new. It's been that way since November of 2020, or really, I guess, technically since uh, Inauguration Day, January of 2021. And that's a really important point because Democrats can push their party agenda, um, and they're doing so right now through what they're calling the Build Back Better Act. Uh, the Build Back Better Act is really just here are some things that the Democratic Party really cares about, and they're wrapping it up into a budget bill. Well, why is that budget bill important? Well, because when you have a budget bill, we can use reconciliation to move legislation through and avoid a potential filibuster in the Senate. Because while the Democrats do technically control all both branches of Congress and the White House, it's by a razor thin margin in the Senate. And so if any legislation were to face a filibuster, it would be essentially dead. Well, when we're dealing with budgetary things, we can use this reconciliation process where we just need a simple majority to get it through. And so the Democrats are taking their party agenda, wrapping it up into a budget bill and using the reconciliation process to move it through potentially. And this is nothing new. Republicans did it back in 2017 with the Tax Cuts and Job Act. 
Democrats did it back in uh, the early 2000s or the late 2000s with the uh, Affordable Health Care Act. This is not a new strategy. Um, it's just they're the ones that are using it at this particular point in time. Uh, the actual bill itself is trying to expand social programs, things like Medicare, uh, child care and tax credits, uh, education, especially higher education, community college. Uh, the first two years, they want to provide it for um, basically everybody. Uh, and the way they want to pay for it is with direct tax increases and some operational changes. Uh, that, that's always a note I love um, because they want the IRS to essentially be better at being the IRS. And they think that they can raise uh, a not insignificant amount of the revenue by having the IRS basically be better at catching people that should be paying taxes that currently aren't. But the overwhelming majority of this bill, the spending that's in this bill, is really coming from direct tax increases on corporations, high income earners, high net worth individuals. Those are the people that are being targeted right now for tax increases. That all being said, hey, there is a negotiation. It is a back and forth. We don't know exactly where this is gonna land, but we know that that's the target. And so what tax changes are they currently talking about? Uh, the first would be a change to the corporate tax rate above a certain threshold, and that's a key, key note, a change to the corporate tax rate above a certain threshold from 21% to 26.5%. Uh, it's interesting to note, they're not going all the way back to what the corporate tax rate was before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And so they're really going a little less than halfway. Uh, the other thing they want to do is they want to change the top uh, tax bracket from 37 back to the original 39.6. Uh, probably the biggest significant impact in here is changing the long-term capital gains rate, again, above a certain threshold uh, from 20 to 25%. You also got to add in that 3.8% Medicare surcharge. Um, and they want to limit other deductions and losses, the ability for people to kind of use um, some tax flexibility to get around certain tax. They also want to make some changes to a state plan, kind of reducing the exemptions, restricting certain transactions. And then uh, honestly, what a lot of people didn't really see coming out of uh, the proposal was some changes to retirement plans. Uh, these would mostly impact people with uh, really large retirement plan balances. Um, it, it, I would colloquially call it the Peter Thiel rule, um, trying to limit high net worth people from accruing these really, really big Roth IRA and IRA account balances um, and using them as kind of tax shelters. And so that's where the, the limits on conversions would come in, um, the increases on RMDs, and some of these changes could potentially reach down uh, to other clients beyond what just the intended target was. So that's the tax changes that are on the table. What does that mean for the market, right? Because this is not the first time that the market has heard, oh, we want taxes to go up. And so I'm going to make a real quick uh, tangent into economic theory. And I'm going to start by saying, hey, this is economic theory. And I'm also going to make a very gross generalization. Uh, to try and fit a complicated topic into about two minutes of speaking. Uh, but if you believe in modern monetary theory and the idea that the federal government can't go broke, the reason why it can't go broke is because it prints its own money, right? So if the federal government wants to go spend a dollar, it can print a dollar to go spend it, right? And so it's not so much the size of the deficit because everybody kind of says, all right, well, the government is really spending a dollar that it didn't take in, and that's a bad thing. I can't run my household that way. I can't run my business that way. That's true. You can't, um, but your household and your business also doesn't print its own money. The government does, and so it can spend on a deficit. We can, uh, an argument about how big that deficit should be and whether it should exist at all is probably a conversation for another time. It's the simple fact of the matter that the government can do that. And if the government can print its own money and the government can spend at a deficit, then a really important number to watch becomes inflation. If you remember, that's what we talked about last quarter is, hey, what's happening with inflation? Is this a number we need to watch? And we went more into detail about why it's important. And it's coming up again because inflation is that number that tells us, hey, are things going okay? 
Because when the government spends at a deficit, what it's really doing is it's saying, hey, I spent a dollar that I didn't collect back in taxes. And so that dollar is going to either a government worker, a government contractor, it's making its way somewhere into the private sector. And so the private sector becomes a steward for that dollar. And as long as the private sector utilizes that dollar better than it would have been utilized at the government level, then everything's good or so modern monetary theory would say. And that's why inflation becomes that big number is because if the private sector doesn't efficiently use that dollar, prices go up or the supply of goods goes down and prices go up. And so inflation is that target number. It's also important to note that uh, late last year, the Federal Reserve quietly kind of changed the way that it looks at inflation and said, hey, rather than having this hard target 2%, um, we're really going to be a little bit more flexible about it. Uh, they came out and said, when we change interest rates, it has an abnormal impact on low-income households and low-income earners. Uh, we don't want to keep doing that. We're going to be a little bit looser with how we target inflation. And so all of this information is known by the market. It's all been priced in by the market because these are comments that were made in September 2020. These are tax proposals that were made in January of 2021. And the market response really since all of that came in has been neutral and favorable. The market uh, is not entirely unhappy with deficit spending. The market likes it when there are more dollars that gets to use on the private side than on the government side. And that's illustrated in the fact that the market's largely been positive uh, over 2021. Now in Q3, the market was basically flat, slightly negative. The big outlier there would be emerging markets. But in general, equity markets and fixed income markets uh, were basically flat. And that was even going through all the tax proposals, the infrastructure bill, all the legislative risk that was coming out of Washington. The markets generally took a ambivalent view. But year to date, the markets are still extremely positive, right? If you had a market cap weighted portfolio of 100% equities from January until the end of Q3, you're essentially up 11.5%. Now, the number goes down as we add bonds in the portfolio, as it should, right? Because bonds are less volatile, they're more conservative, they're less risky than stocks. But on the whole, most people, while they might have been negative for Q3, are positive for the year as a whole. And the market will continue to input that new information as tax proposals come out, as tax legislation comes out. And as long as we don't see a significant sea change um, or we don't have a significant event that really drives the market in a different direction, it's just gonna take some time to process out these changes and decide, okay, hey, we might be raising taxes over here, but is that allowing more people to spend money over there? And can the private sector handle that? And to the extent that it can, then we can keep volatility in check. But obviously one of the things that we do at Granite Harbor Advisors is kind of updating our market evaluations, updating our macroeconomic assumptions, and then being able to make changes as they are reasonable and uh, appropriate. So one of the things we always encourage our clients to do, hey, if your situation has changed, if you... Um, have some concerns, please reach out, call us. If you see this video and you go, hey, you made a comment and I really think you're entirely wrong or I'd like to hear more uh, information about that, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, you can get us through our website, graniteharbor.com. You can also uh, call us on the phone the old fashioned way or shoot us an email. Um, but anybody that would like to hear a little bit more about uh, what can be a fairly complicated topic in 15 minutes to cover, by all means, please feel free to reach out. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.